Fact about it, the world want a gospel that is reflective of the world culture. See, in the world, you know, you're supposed to be able to allow everybody to come along with you. Allow everybody to get along with you. Allow everybody to have diversified culture. Allow everybody. The world really want God to be fair. I just thought I'd let you in on that. The world wants God to be fair. And if God is not fair, they're mad at him. The world is even saying, why can't everybody go to heaven? Why does Jesus have to be the only way? I don't know if you heard that, but that's what's going on right now. The world is saying, why does Jesus have to be the only way? Why can't it be Buddha? Why can't it be Zeus? Why not Muhammad? Why not Allah? Why not a squirrel or a dog or a rabbit, whatever you want to call to be your high power? The world is saying, I want to come to Jesus, but I want to, I want to come to God, excuse me, but I want to come to God my way. Did you not know that there's a great schism with the world? When I say the world, I'm talking about sinners. The world and God, they're mad at God. They're saying God is not fair. Just imagine that. God, you're not fair. Why does Jesus have to be the only way? And there are many so-called believers that are turning themselves off from God. But there are some absolute truths. Number one, God is real. Whether you believe in God or not, he is still real. Now let me break it down to you. God is not the universe. And we have a lot of uh, uh, people that are now talking about the universe, God is the universe, and everything flows through the universe. And the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of that is God. The, the universe, the universe is God. There are many, many so-called believers that are saying the universe is God. The atmosphere of the universe, the solar system, the, uh, uh, all of these things makes up God, so therefore they say you are God, and since you are God, you're part of the universe, and therefore you need to tap into the God that is in you. The gospel of confusion, they got people all confused because they want people to look at God as a universe, which means you have forfeited the one who created the universe. God cannot be the universe and yet the creator of the universe at the same time. Who came before God? No one. Is it the chicken or is it the egg? Is it the chicken or is it the egg? No. No one knows God himself is the sovereign ruler of the universe. Amen. So if you're calling on the universe to come and help you, you're missing God. If you're calling on your ancestors to come and help you, who was before your ancestors? Who was before the universe? Who was before the moon? Who was before the stars? Who was before the creation of the world? Who was before man? Who was before the galaxies? Who was before? He is the self-existent one. His name is Yahweh, which means existed. He been here before here was here. But now there are many people that want to use the universe, the stars, and all of these things, and ancestor as God. I want you to know, church, the God you serve is real. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When you seek God, you will find him. And there are many believers in churches this Sunday morning that do not believe in God. Now, some of you may look at me like I'm crazy. The church is packed with people that don't believe in God. They believe in what God brings. They, you know, they want the gift, but they don't want the giver. You know, they want the gold, but they don't want he who made the gold. They want the blessing, but they don't want the man that create the blessing. They want the things, but they don't want to be committed to he that created the things. They want all that God provides, but they don't want God, nor do they want to know God. The Bible says it is the fool that says in his heart, there is no God. But there are many that are doing that. 
right in the church. They want to be a part of big churches so they can feel good because their self-esteem is so low and they don't feel better until they're around something that's bigger than them. They don't see God the same way you see him. They don't want a relationship with a God. They just want to be able to name drop God. I go to church and I do this. It's amazing how some people think God is stupid. They think God is dumb. They think God does not see his ways. It's the scripture says, he that forms the eye with the seven bones that in the eye, he says, shall he not see? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? There are some absolute truths, and one of them is God is real. And he is not the universe. He is the creator of the universe and every thing in it. The second of this is Jesus is real. Somebody say, well, can there be three in one? There can be five in one. You got one hand and five digits. God is real. Jesus is real. And since everybody wants everything fair in the world, they say, if Jesus is real, why does Jesus have to be the only way? Why can't we come to God some other kind of way? Did you not know they tried that? That's not new. They, they've already tried that. They tried that with Baal. They tried that with Zeus. They tried that with Dalgon. They tried that with Zuru. They tried that with Muhammad. They tried that with Buddha. They're still trying that with Muhammad. They've already tried that, and many of them go straight to hell simply because they have not acknowledged the fact that Jesus is the only way to God. I'm not saying that. That's what Jesus said. He's the one said it in John 14 and 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, period, the truth, period, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now somebody say, well, that's really cocky. No, it may be cocky, but how many of you know that cocky can be fact? Cocky can be true. You ain't bragging when you did it. You ain't bragging when you know you can do it. That's why Muhammad Ali said, I'm going to knock you out in the sixth round. That wasn't, that wasn't bragging. That was fact. How we know it's fact. In the sixth round, he got what? Knocked out. See, when you know the word of God and you know it's in your heart, you ain't got to brag about it. Just be about it. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was letting them know that you can't come to God except you come through me. See, I would rather know the truth because the truth that you know make you free. So Jesus is real. The third on that, the Holy Ghost is real. You can receive him or not. Like you can believe in God or not. Like you can believe Jesus is the only way or not. It's your choice. You can receive the Holy Spirit or not. God is not going to make you receive anything that his word has already told you to do. The Holy Spirit is real. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The Holy Ghost is real. He is real. God is real, and the Holy Ghost is real, and Jesus is real. Because you don't believe in them does not mean that they're unreal. Many times, many believers and those that are not saved, you may have mag magical thinking because you think something is not there does not mean it is not there. All of these requires faith, in, meaning that I got to believe in this. The only, one th the only thing you can do to, to really get God moving for you, it's only one word, and it's called believing. If you believe God and you believe that Jesus died for his sins, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, you're saved. The only thing that will send you to hell is unbelief. If you're going to go to hell, it's going to be because you don't believe. Write this down. Sin will not send you to hell. You know why? Because Jesus has already paid for that. That debt is already paid. That's why you have to confess your sins. He already, 
He, he already paid for your sins. So sins will not send you to hell. The quickest thing that will send anyone to hell that's in the world is unbelief. If you don't believe in Jesus as your personal Savior, that is what sends you to hell. But you have to decide that God is real. You got to believe in your heart that Jesus is the only way to God. You got to believe in your heart the Holy Spirit is real. This is the triune nature of God's power. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And they're all there to help you to be better, better people. Today we have these people that call themselves atheists. They're in the church, by the way. You wonder why people, when they go to church, and they go to church, been going to church for years, and nothing changed. And, and that's simply because they really don't believe in God. They, they really want to be a part of something. We can call it spiritual hyperbole, or we can call it pretense, or we can call it, uh, I'm just doing something. You know, uh, this is a ritual, it's a habit, and I just get up and go to church, and and I really don't believe in what they're preaching. I, I, I really, really don't think uh, what the pastor's preaching is right. And, and, uh, but I'm going to go along. One of these days, something's going to hit me, and I'm going to figure it out. And God be doing all kind of things trying to get their attention, but they just won't believe. God is so loving that he'll give you a car, and he'll give you a brand new house with credit that's just ridiculous bad credit. And that's his way of saying, I'm in your life. Your credit score is not even a three. It's round a two. And the man you married to, he ain't even on, he, his stuff ain't even on the chart. But yet God still provides for you. You go to the doctor and, and you know, the doctor give you a diagnosis and, and it's a crazy diagnosis. But yet God allows you to continue to live and over time that diagnosis leaves. I know there are people many times that have had all kinds of diseases and, and where they should have had limbs cut off, and, but yet those limbs just continue to live. And these are people that don't receive God, nor do they believe in God. See, we serve a God that loves us so much until he provides for us even when we are insulting him. When we are insulting him with unbelief, when we're insulting him, talking about what we can do, how we can do it, and we never give God the praise, the honor, and the credit, he still provides for us. Well, how do we back that up? The word of God tells us, and I believe it's Romans 5 and 8, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. Now, towards us means to us. He give us love when we are acting the fool. Well, what is his love? His love is all the things that we need to sustain ourselves in life. But an atheist don't see it. Let me give you the definition of an atheist. So if you're talking to some people that say, well, I don't believe in God. And, and by the way, uh, there's no such thing as not believing in God. They just haven't got there yet. An atheist, the definition of an atheist is this, is the belief God doesn't exist. That's the definition of an atheist. The belief that God doesn't exist. You tell your atheist friends, if God doesn't exist, then why are you here? Why are you here if he doesn't exist? They know God exists, but they're mad at him because they want him to reveal himself to them in a so-called special way. When all they have to do if they want to know God exists is look in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, you will see all of God's creation in you. That's what an atheist, the Bible calls him a fool. The Bible says it is the fool or a fool that says there is no God. Then we have these theists, these people that are theism, and that is T-H-E-I-S-M. It's the belief that God exists, 
by faith. And we have a lot of, a lot of believers that believe that God exists, but they don't have faith to believe that God will come to do what they need him to do in their lives. That's a theism. That's really you. You by faith, God. You see, if, if it was based on the universe, see, your, your mind can't hold the universe. Fact about it, your mind can't even hold your own intelligentsia. That's why the only way we get to know God is through faith. We have to believe it. When we believe it, then things begin to take place. So can you imagine preaching to a bunch of folks that don't even believe in God? They get up and shout. They run around the church. They holler and they scream. And they go back home and be defeated because they really don't believe in God. Have you ever ran into a skeptic? A skeptic. It's S-K-E-P-T-I-C. That's a person inclined to question God's existence. A person inclined to question God's existence. And again, all you got to do is just say, why don't you go out and go to a, a store and buy a lily and spend three or four days studying the lily and come back and tell me, does God exist? And if you don't want to study a lily, then just go in your backyard and look at the tree and study the tree. It's amazing what, what your environment can teach you. If you don't want to study the tree, just get you a little dog and watch what your dog does. And if you don't want to study a dog, just kind of go out and find your little ant hill and, and study the ants. And if you don't want to believe the ants, just wait till the birds come out and just do an ornithology study and just kind of watch different files and how they react to God. Everything they do is about God. You're thinking it's about you. You're thinking the birds are singing to you. They're singing to God. On YouTube, they did a, a dramatic thing, and I got caught up in it. You know, I kind of get caught up in stuff that most people don't. And it's, you know, animals and birds and insects and whales and things of that nature. And they had a, a, a dramatization of a bird that was singing. And then they had, after that one, they had a dramatization of birds that was dancing. That was literally two or three birds that was doing the moonwalk. I was so amazed to see the birds doing the moonwalk. I mean, they were doing the moonwalk backwards. I mean, they were break dancing and, and, and they were doing all kind of things because they had the music playing to it. And, and I was like, well, why are these birds doing that? The, the birds was doing it because they're giving praise to God. But this one bird was singing so, so beautifully, I just, I just stopped and started listening to the birds. The bird wasn't singing to me. The bird was not singing to the other birds. The birds was giving his praise to God. We have to understand is that God created nature and he created all of those things that are around us. And all of those things that are around us is to remind us that the birds, the dogs, the cows, whatever, they know who their creator is. And they're born instinctively to give praise to God. So for the skeptic, the question to ask the skeptic is, why are you skeptic? They're always trying to question God's existence. Then you have the agnostic. We get the word agnosticism from that. The agnostic view of God is unknown or unknowable. In other words, they say to know God is unknown. Now, in some cases, the agnostic is correct. Because you can't know him without believing in him. If you don't believe God, then how are you going to know him? And Hebrews 11 and 6 give us that. I got to know him before I believe in him. Now, how does all this work when it comes to preachers who are afraid to tell the truth? Let's get into it. Be quick. You see, if you are called to preach, you have a responsibility to tell the truth about God's word. One thing I realized that even when the word hits me, I still got to tell the truth. You see, in the Hebrew, the word for call or calling is gara, G-A-R-A, gara. In the Greek, it is kaleo, 
which means to call. So when God called a man or a woman, he's not calling you for nothing. He's calling you for something. There is a calling by the Holy Ghost, which is effectuous. The effectual calling of God is tantamount to his sovereign choice. So when God called you, he called you because he chose you. You didn't call yourself. And if you did, you won't last long. You've heard me say many years ago, and I say today, your calling will prove you. If you're called, you're going to do what God tells you to do. First of all, you're going you're gonna to do what the Word requires you to do. The Word says, for us as preachers, we are to gather ourselves together. We are to go out and witness. We are to win souls for Christ. All of that is in the calling. We can't say I'm called and never win nobody. We can't say I'm called and never come to church. Like now we got people that say they're called, but they, they like to have their little clubs, and they go here and they go there, and yet they say they're called. What well, the Scripture says, fail not to assemble yourselves together. So if you're called, you need to be around other believers. And if that's a church, fine, but you can't heap together. Here's what happened with a lot of, lot of preachers that say they're called. They get mad at the pastor or they get mad at the bishop, and they get a few people together that's also mad at the pastor, mad at the bishop, and then they leave and go start a church, and the church is basically being started out of rebellion. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You got pastors and preachers that are starting churches because they don't want to submit to the pastor or the bishop that they're under. So they go start a church. So basically, the church should be named Rebellious Ministries because that's how it's getting started. You got to submit yourself to somebody. Can, can somebody say, I need to submit? You see, they are referred to the call according to his purpose. You see, when you're called to preach, you're not a call according to your, pur your purpose. Everybody coming up with all these slick ministry because that's their person. That's, see, it, it's their vision. It's not God's vision. When it's your vision, uh, then you want to work that. But when God says, no, I need you to do some fundamental things, what are the fundamental things? How about going to church and get there on time? That's fundamental. How about loving people that you know can't stand you? That's fundamental. How about doing for others as you would have them to do for yourself? That's fundamental. How about not trying to be stuffy and pokey and, and, and hiding everybody else and you, you, can't nobody hug you. They got to get in the line just to shake your hand and the devil is alive. How about humbling yourself? But see, when it's your ministry, you want everything to come to you. You know what that's called? That's man's way of honor. You know what God's way of honor is? God's way of honor is getting with the people. God's way of honoring the people is to get with the people. God's way of honoring the people is to make yourself accessible to the people. God's way of honoring people is to get dirty with the people, and when they hurt, you hurt. Did you not notice one thing that's true? The shepherd was always walking with the sheep. The shepherd didn't have a line where, okay, well, I got to go through this and go through that so I can get to the, to the shepherd. Jesus was always with the sheep. Isn't that right? Jesus didn't say, well, I'll holler back at y'all. Uh, leave me alone. I'm up here right now. Wherever Jesus went, the people had accessibility to Jesus. Wherever he went, and even at times that some of them tried to kill him, but the Bible says that he walked through the crowd. Why? Because if God is with you, who can be what? Against you. They can't touch you. But we have preachers today that have built up the magic kingdom. And the only way you can get to them is that you got to do some things in order to get to them. But the word of God doesn't tell us that. Romans 8 and 28 says, it says this, all things work it together for the good for them that love the Lord and to them that are the call according to his purposes. You see, it's you are called according to God's purposes, not yours. Please get that. Please get that. There can be no belief or trust without hearing. 
That's why it's important to hear the word of God. And that's why the devil will try to do everything he can to keep you from hearing the word of God. There can be no hearing without preaching. That's why he tried to get preachers tied all up. The worst thing the devil want to do to a preacher is get you tied all up. He want to take away your confidence. He want to get you caught up in adultery. He want to get you caught up in drugs. He want to get you caught up in doing dumb things. And then when he gets you caught up in it, he want to shut your mouth. Shut your mouth for what? Because people today think preachers are perfect. Preachers are not perfect. Preachers have issues just like everybody else. They have issues just like everybody else. They have struggles like everybody else. They go through the same thing everybody else go through. The difference is our struggle is intensified by a thousand percent. Because the devil wants to put the muzzle on most preachers so you won't believe them when they preach to you. And what I say to preachers, be quick to repent, quick to forgive, and quick to love. Just admit it. Do what I do. I know I'm undone. Can somebody say I'm undone? So don't be expecting perfection out of me because you're not going to get it. You will never get it. You're going to get a man that's pursuing God as God pursuing him. Paul said it this way, I'm thriving for holiness. He also said that uh, the things that I want to do, I can't do. And the things that I don't want to do are the things that I do. He gets so angry at himself and said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? I'm preaching to everybody else, but who shall deliver me from this body of sin that I live in? So the, so the enemy want to muzzle the mouth of preachers to tell the truth because of the sin that they may be in. That's why you got to repent of your sins and keep preaching the word of God. Don't let the devil stop you. God called you knowing your propensity. God called you knowing your proclivities. He called you knowing that you was a mess. And now he has turned your mess into a message, and all you have to do is keep preaching, keep teaching. Don't let the devil stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Will the church say amen? You see, reaching men of God begins with the commission of the messenger. Through preaching, hearing, and trust, men are brought to call upon the name of the Lord. See, no one can come to God unless they hear a word. It's through preaching and through hearing and through trust. I like to say it this way. You got to know God for yourself. I didn't go to seminary, and thank God I didn't. God blessed me to be around great men and women. Every last one of them, except for one, had doctorate degrees. One had a doctorate in Hebrew. Another one was well, well wed, and I end up learning through him, Dr. McAllister, Pastor McAllister. Pastor Whitelock and her husband, doctorate in Hebrew. Pastor Fields in Mulberry Grove's little old backyard country like church. I end up learning from him. All of these things took place. See, a lot of times we want to. Say, I got to get this or I got to get that. Well, really, all you really have to do is have a relationship with Christ on your own. Never have a relationship with God through your mama or your daddy. You better know him for yourself. It's for the young people. You better know Jesus for yourself. You better know God for yourself because if they ain't there, what you going to do? Your girlfriend can't help you when you're going through some real stuff. When you're going through some real stuff, your girlfriend can't help you. Or, or your guy friend can't help you. You better know him for yourself. And the only way you get to know him for yourself, you got to spend time with him. Today we are laboring under the curse of preachers who are afraid to tell the truth. They are completely afraid to tell the truth. The world seemed to be screaming lies while some preachers are whispering the truth. Let me say it again. The world seemed to be screaming lies while some preachers are whispering the truth. 
The world has been taken hostage. I mean, the church has been taken hostage by the world because the church has bought into fairness. You got to be fair with these people. And when you are fair to these people, they'll treat you right. These, the lifestyle of the preachers, they want so much for the world to be right until they're afraid that if they tell the truth, the people in the church will leave. If they tell the truth, the people in the church will just go. So what do they sacrifice? They sacrifice the truth to keep membership. They sacrifice truth to keep people to like the pastor. That's my favorite pastor. How's your favorite? How many do you have? And that's why some people are confused. They got six pastors on TV. They got four pastors. In other words, they church hop. When they go over here, that's their pastor. They go over there, that's their pastor. And when they get through running around all over here, that's their pastor. They got their television pastor. They got their YouTube pastor. They got their Facebook pastor. They got all kind of pastors not knowing that you only need one shepherd in order to grow. And you wonder why that you would tolerate so much is because who's feeding you is what you learn to tolerate. We need to have preachers preaching the same gospel and telling the truth about it. Let's look at something else. You see, preachers must stand up and speak up and proclaim the word of God to a godless world. Not for fear of what may happen to them, their churches, and their lifestyle. But for what will happen to the world if they don't. If we don't preach the word... What is the world going to do? As preachers, we cannot fear, let our fear direct our path. If you're a preacher or, or even just a, a good congregant, a good Christian, don't let fear direct your path. In other words, you're afraid to tell somebody the truth because you're fearful that they won't like you anymore. We're in this time now where people are so emotionally sprung. Everybody want a friend. Everybody wants somebody to click the like button. And if they don't click the like button, your little feelings are hurt. The internet and the social media are producing weak people. You got people bullying you on your first Facebook when all you have to do is click it off. Don't even read it. What you reading it for? So the, so the world is dictating to the church, and now we got believers looking at each other's Facebook and making comments, and praise God, some of it is good, and sometimes, well, you didn't post me this, and I didn't get this on your Twitter site, and, and uh, I post good morning, and you didn't say nothing back. <laughs> I post this, and you didn't, you didn't tag me in producing weak people. And if you're a weak person in the world, you're going to be a weak Christian. So the devil is setting you up for weakness. So as a preacher, we cannot let fear direct our path. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That's 2 Timothy 1 and 7. You see, we must not be afraid to tell the truth. How many of you in here would rather for somebody just keep lying to you or you want somebody to tell you the truth? Raise your hand if you believe in truth and don't mind telling the truth. Now, see, if, if you're emotionally weak, you're going to always want to hear the good stuff. You learn through your pain through the bad stuff. But if you got fear, you don't have love. Because the scripture says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts it out fear. Because fear has torment. Fear has torment in it. And we are made perfect in love. So whenever fear is getting up on you, you don't believe that God loves you and that God will take care of you. Because if you believe God loves you and he will take care of you, fear will leave you. I want you to think about that now. You're worrying about uh, what's going to happen or, or is this going to work out for me and, and why this ain't working and what's going on with that. That's all fear. That's anxieties of fear. You want to do it. You want to make the way. But a perfect love casts out all fear. What perfect love? 
the perfect love that I believe that God has for me. When God loves you, he will not allow the devil to wreck you. So if you're worrying about what's going to happen in two years or am I going to be able to do this thing next year, that's nothing but fear. Perfect love casted out fear. When you believe that God loves you, you don't worry about that stuff. That's why a lot of times when my wife and I are talking, I don't stress nothing. If it's out of my control, it's in his control. And if he don't deal with it, that ain't on me. Why? He told me, cast all thy cares, all thy fears under him. And then he was bold enough to say, and I will give thee rest. What am I holding on to stuff that I can't control? That's fear. Look to your neighbor and say, no more fear here. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say, no more fear here. You see, if it's out of your control, it's in his control. And the reason why you're raising all this sand at home, are we going to pay the bill? Can we get this here done? Is the car note going to be able to get paid? Are we going to be able to get this? That's nothing but fear. And whatever you dwell on is what the devil will focus on. Let me say it again. Whatever you dwell on is what the devil will focus on. So if you start saying, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this here. I may not be able to retire. I don't know if this is going to happen. I don't know if God is going to make a way. That's fear. Can everybody say, that's fear? That's fear. I can't hear you. Say, that's fear. That's fear. How are you going to believe in God and, and, and carry so much fear? You need to get out of your own way. And when you get out of your own way, you need to say, I serve a God that loves me. Can the church say, God is in love with me? I can't hear you say, God is in love with me. That's perfect love. Perfect love. It's not you in love with God because your love ain't perfect. Okay, let's make that clear. It's not you in love with God. So when the word said perfect love, cast it out all fear, that's God's love for you. And it's God's love for you that will cast out or should cast out all of your fear. Amen. Amen. Oh, you should have gave God a hand praise on that. Right. So why are you afraid? You're afraid because you don't believe that God going to take care of you. You don't believe that God going to open up a door. You're, the, you're, you're trusting in man, but you're not trusting in God. You're trusting in, well, uh, we ain't got enough money to do this. We can't do that. You, you're trusting in man rather than God. See, you serve a God that, that has more than enough. He, <laughs> Lord Jesus. You're serving a God that wants the absolute best for you. He said, I would that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prosper. Why are you demeaning God with your fear? Did you not know fear it's something that will bring destruction onto you. When you are fearing, you're attracting demons. So if you fear that your body is breaking down, them demons said, okay, we got something to attack. If you fear that you're not going to be able to make it to retirement, the demons said, okay, we got something to attack. Let's do everything we can to block it. When you begin to fear, you give the devil assignments. And his assignment in them demons is to come in and deal with what you gave them. How do you know you gave it to them? Your fear gave it to them. Fear will, is like moss attracted to a, a flame. Uh, fear will cause demons to be attracted to you. Did you not know in the word of God that there are 365 fear knots? One for every day of the year including leap year. God says, fear not. That's what he means. So if you're afraid, that means you're not trusting. If you're fearing, that means you're not trusting. And as preachers, we got to teach people not to be fearing what you're afraid of. You're part of the kingdom family. You're part of the king. You're under the king. You can't be supreme when you're under the king. God is in control of you. Everything you want is all in him. And remember, perfect love casted out all fear. It's not my love for God. It's God's love for me. That's what casts out all fear. Don't be afraid, preachers, to tell the truth. 
The people will love you today and crucify you tomorrow. They'll be singing Hosanna, Hosanna today. And as soon as you get caught up in some, I knew something was wrong with that man. Oh, uh, y'all better hear me now. Especially you preachers. You get caught up in anything, anything that look like a rumor, is all on Facebook. And if they got a podcast, they'll do a podcast, 30-minute podcast on, on, on what you've done. And today, we're in crazy season. If you say good morning to somebody, some female, that's sexual harassment. If you open up a door for her and say, wow, you know, you smell nice. Uh, and now she thinking because she twisted in the head and, and her emotion is so strong, she never had nobody to say something nice to her. And because you say something nice to her, she think you like her. Now she done went to your job and filed something on you, and now you got to go explain, this is just who I am. That's why sometimes you have to pull back your personality and, and see people and just don't see them. I don't care if you got gold wrapped all around your head, around your leg. I don't care if you look like an angel. Men, just shut up and keep moving. Because some of these females are just so weak. They ain't ever had nobody say, I love you. Never had nobody say, you look nice. And the moment you cross the line and say, you look nice, oh, girl, he likes me. Don't know how to like you. That's what you call hospitality. That's what you call just being decent. We done went so far past the age of being decent that when you are decent, people think you want some. Come on now, just tell the truth. This is very important for you to know. Everywhere you go today, many preachers are filled with zealous lust. Now, I'm not talking about sexual lust. I'm talking about the desire to have some things. Zealous lust and ambition to outdo another preacher. Just so you know, church, there's some major competition going on in churches all across America. Preachers trying to outdo one another. Preachers trying to see how big the church can be. Preachers trying to see what type of car one another drive. Preachers trying to uh, basically clone different words. And in other words, when they want a sermon, they go and, and, and steal your sermon. They look up archive sermons and, and, and get a revelation of what somebody else has preached. When the Word of God says there's nothing new under the sun, But God will give you a revelation that will be new to you. But we have competition in the pulpit. We got competition with churches. And, and we got some, some preachers that are telling their people, don't go to that church. Uh, if you got members that go there, don't be over there because they ain't quite right. You know, don't do this and don't do that. And you don't want to be by that church. I had a young man was telling me the other day at, at the gym, he said, well, uh, we would never go to that church because, uh, you know, the, uh, the preacher over there was doing something uh, funny with the money. And I said, oh, okay. I said, uh, is, is, is there an indictment or, or is it real? No, it's real. And I said, okay. I said, what else is, what else is he doing? I'm trying to get him now. I said, so what else is he doing? Well, you know, he just preached differently and all this stuff. And I said, okay. I said, did you not know that there are 613 commandments? He's like, I thought it was 10. I said, that's the point. You don't even know if it's 613. Don't come to me with no garbage. It's garbage. I don't care if he was messing around with a thousand women. That's between him and God. Ain't nothing you can do about it. God sees it. God knows it. I said, so you don't know if there's 613 commandments. Well, no, I thought it was just 10. I said, that's my point. You thought it was 10. It's 613. I said, do you know all 613? Uh, I, I said, you don't even know the 10 commandments, do you? No, I know a few of them. I said, that's, that's another point. How can you obey something that you don't know? I said, did you not know that man speak have 70,000 thoughts that come through his head every day? No, I didn't know that. You ain't studying. 
But you want to indict preachers, you want to indict pastors, you want to indict Christians that are struggling. We all are struggling with something. Every last one of us. You want to say this man is bad and you don't have facts? You don't even know what he did? You wasn't there? You didn't see it? You just run in your mouth. I said, do you have perfect thoughts every day? I said, have you had a suicidal thought? I'm talking about just floated through. Well, sometimes, you know, I, I said, but if it's 7,000, 70,000, if one is perverted, all of them are perverted. I said, as a man, you speak 7,000 words. Now, he, he, he looking sad now, a little melancholy. As a man, you speak 7,000 words a day. Who did you cuss out yesterday? Who you plan on cussing out today? Who you said something stupid to today? Whether it's your mother or your wife or maybe it was your kid. Get out that bed. Y'all make me sick. That's perverted. I said, we can't live this on our own. We need God. If everybody left a church because of what the pastor was doing, there would be no churches. Because every pastor on the planet is undone. Now, he may be dumb enough to think he's better than everybody else, but he's undone. He may be sick and twisted in the head and thinking that they come to church to see him. And if he's that way, he's undone. Never come to church to see your pastor. You come to church to get the word that the pastor preached to you. And you're getting word from an imperfect vessel. He's imperfect, but he was chosen by God to give you a word because God can trust him to do it when he needs for him to do it. And if you really want to understand something, people used to say, well, you know, the preacher, he drink too much. Now, this is back in the day. They probably still do it. It's just a little bit more slick with it. He drink too much. And on Sunday morning, the preacher get up and shut the church down, preaching like he crazy. And the word be so good until your toes curl. And as soon as he leaves the church, by that Sunday night, he drunk all over again. And you say, well, God used him. He's already did. See, he used imperfect vessels to preach a perfect word. Because we can't preach it on our own. But the enemy would try to have you to preach this garbage and to tell people they're going to hell because they're not living right. Fact about it, you ain't living right. To all preachers that are hearing this word, you know and I know you got a bunch of mess going on. You know and I know your struggle. You know and I know you pray to God. God, that you can make it through a day without having some stupid roll through your head. <laughs> That's the struggle of preaching. Imperfect people preaching to imperfect people. And the only thing that gets us to be perfected is in Christ. That's why we are in him. Mm -mm -mm. We are in him and he in us. Help us, Holy Ghost. So when you witness this to somebody about Jesus Christ, you ain't got to tell them, you know what, I just got through lying last night. I smoked a joint last night. I was a little high. I did something crazy. You ain't got to tell them that. All you got to do is just say, I do understand. How many of you have been witnesses to somebody that, that was in the sin that you was in and, and, and you didn't repent and you asked God, God, forgive me, but now you're talking to them that just did the same thing you did last night? But the enemy want to silence you by getting you to feel guilty. That's why the scripture says, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, Period. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 3, verse 16, verse 17, he says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It is easy for God to condemn us. That's nothing. That's easy. You know why it's easy? Because most of us, when we do wrong, we condemn ourselves. 
How many of you just went back home one time after you got through doing some crazy stuff and just felt so bad, and you said, Lord, please stop me, Lord, stop me, Lord. Lord, I hate this. And Lord, you know, I'm going to stop one of these days. One of these days I'm going to stop. And, and then you get mad at yourself, and you start setting dates. I'm going to stop it on this day. And, and, and you give yourself another uh, liberation, clean date. I'm going to stop it on that day. And before you know, you'd have made all these dates. And how many you know why you're making dates? You're violating dates. That's why you have to surrender it to God because you can't stop it. If you could have stopped it, you would have stopped it a long time ago. And that's why uh, Romans 5 and 8 says, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Your job is to receive his grace. Your job is to trust in the fact that God loves you and that he gives you grace and his grace is sufficient for you. Somebody getting it. So preachers, don't throw rocks when you're in a glass house. You ain't got to be afraid to tell the truth. Just tell the truth. And tell the truth by starting with yourself. Some preachers want bigger churches, but without having bigger people. Let me say it again. Some preachers want bigger churches, but they don't want bigger people. See, when I leave here, I want to know that you can stand on your own. That's what me and my wife both want to know. We want to know you know how to pray. We want to know that you ain't got to be calling nobody. Time. Can you pray that my toenail go back in? We want to know you can handle this book by yourself, that you got to be, you need to be skillful with this book. You need to know how to go in and get out what you need, amen? So they want bigger churches without having bigger people. Therefore, they produce a church of weak believers. To be true, to be a true man of God, you must overcome, overcome your pride. If you are prideful, God cannot and will not use you. It's not going to happen. You must get rid of your ego and your fear. You must be willing to serve others without complaining. How some people want to serve, but they want you to, you know, pat them on the back of the head for it. You must be willing to do the dirty work and always tell the truth to God's people. See, if you're working and you're complaining, I don't know why I got to do this here, why I got to cut the grass, and why I got to do this here, or I don't know why I got to mop the floor, and, you know, and I got to do this here. Why can't we get somebody else? See, if you're complaining while working, then that work that you're doing is in vain. Just like God wants cheerful givers, he also wants cheerful workers to work in the vineyard. Amen? Get ready to wrap this up. To be a true man or woman of God, you must overcome your pride, ego, and your fear. You must be willing to serve others without complaining. You must be willing to do the dirty work and always tell the truth. As a preacher, we are protect. Our job is to protect and serve the people of God. That's what your job is, to protect and serve the people of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We must also... Be able to protect the wolves from the sheep clothes, to protect our people from wolves in sheep clothing. But here's the caveat. However, we must not become the wolves we are trying to protect them from. You shouldn't be the wolf that you're trying to protect the people from. And there are a lot of wolves in sheep clothing but they become the wolf because they're preying on the sheep. As preachers, we must keep the word of God in our mouth day and night for maximum result. In other words, there should not be a time that you're not willing to talk about God. Well, I'm with my girlfriends, and they just want to talk about basketball. Why? If they don't want to talk about God, you shouldn't be with your girlfriends. Well, pastor, that ain't fair. It's fair if you want to go to heaven. Why are believers are so weak? They don't want to pray out loud. They don't want to carry their Bible. They're hiding their Bible. That's why some of them are so happy they got cell phones so they can put it on that. I mean, why are believers so weak? Believers are weak because they have weak 
pastors and preachers. You will become the man or woman that you listen to the most. Write that down. That's words. You will become the man or woman you listen to the most. If you listening to weak preachers, you will become weak. And we wonder why we got a bunch of weak folks in churches, can't pray, and uh, you know, it's, it's a mess because the preachers are afraid to tell the truth. We got preachers that want you to depend on them. Don't bring your Bible. We're going to put it on the screen and uh, just believe what I tell you. As long as you're happy and dumb, they're good. But when you start to challenge them with the word of God, they're mad. Where you get that from? Well, you know, the Lord showed that to me in the scripture. Well, how, how did you get that interpretation? Well, the Holy Spirit gave me the interpretation. Well, how do you know it's right? I believe. I'm bringing it to you to see, do you believe this? I, I, I need you to be my shepherd, so I'm bringing this to you to see if you can tell me something different. Or if you agree with me. See, preachers don't want that because now they got to study as long as you're dumb and sitting up in church, they ain't got to study. That's why we like to see Bibles up in here. That's why we say, examine the word for yourself. Don't believe nothing I tell you. Go and search it out for yourself. As preachers, we cannot treat people different because they have a lot of money. See, that's going on in the church right now. You have celebrity preachers and People lining up because they got money. And that's a phase that I think some believers go through. You know, like somehow their word is different than the word you've been getting. And come to find out, their word is no different. So you don't treat nobody different because they got money. When you treat them different, then, then you start to think that they're more than what they are. I heard a sermon by Bishop Jakes, and he said it this way. He said, stop getting in line to, to shake my hand. He said, you ain't got to get in line. He said, my hand is no different than anybody else's hand. See, preachers that would tell you that are more interested in you being strong on your own. I was guilty of that. Sometime I would go to conference and couldn't wait to see my so-called favorite preacher. My wife and I was down at a particular church, and, you know, and, and what I discovered that the more, the closer, stand up for a minute, daughter, the closer I got to, to people, come on over here, the closer I got to them, the more human I saw they was, the more standoffish I saw they was. And here I am trying to shake hands and all this stuff, and I saw them, and, and the more I saw them who they really was, I started to back up from them. I started to see them for who they are. That they're human beings just like me. Thank you. When you see them for who they really are, as I was uh, sharing also with my daughter, there are some things that you may be at that you don't have to go to because God has already blessed you when you was there. You get to a level where people can only share with you so much because your life experience have already taught you that. And when your life experience have already taught you that, all you're doing is going to hear that again and again. What are you doing to change somebody else's life with your story? I used to tell my wife all the time, stop cheerleading others and be the champion yourself. Everywhere you go, you're cheerleading, folks. Well, God says, I need you to be a champion. I need you to stand up. I need you to write your book about your story. I need you to stand. I need you to be who you need to be. And I had to learn that the one that I was seeking the most was the one that I was. You're running for people, but you need to be running to God. And the more you do that, the more you get from God. So you don't treat people differently because they got money. That's James 2, 1 through 7. As a preacher, you should never condone uh, homosexuality and trans, trans, transsexual. That's not in God's design. Because you agree with it, it doesn't mean that it's right. 
it means that you're wrong and on your way to hell if you don't tell them the truth. You must tell the truth to people at times that uh, they can embarrass you. Like our children can embarrass us. Sometimes members can embarrass the preachers. As a preacher, you must tell them that you're not their God, that you're not responsible for them getting clothes and rings and things and cars and all that. As a preacher, we need to tell the people you just, your biggest issue is that you haven't grown up yet. It ain't got nothing to do with the devil. It's you. you still acting like a child when you need to grow up. And as preachers, as I close, don't be fooled by the empty praise today because the very ones who are praising you today and telling you what a great preacher you are will be the very one on Facebook and on the news camera saying, well, I knew something was different about him. <laughs> I knew something was different about him. You know, he, he, he put on a good act. And it really hurts my heart when I look on YouTube and I see all of these folks that were belonging to churches and as soon as the pastor make a bad choice, how they leave him on a dime. One bad choice. I ain't, ain't saying he's doing all this. They make a bad choice and they're gone. Where's forgiveness at? Everybody wants the pastor to pray for forgiveness, but are you willing to forgive your pastor? You see, that's where the rubber hit the road at. Everybody want Jesus, want to do what Jesus did as he forgave uh, Judas. He forgave Peter. But are you willing to forgive those that hurt you? Not intentional hurt, but hurt that, that you just don't understand. As a preacher, we are called always to tell the truth even if it hurt us. We are not to hold back the truth of God's word for anyone, any place, at any time. We are to tell the truth in love. We're not supposed to beat people up. We're not supposed to make people feel as even worse than what they already feel. We're supposed to make sure that we tell them the truth in love. In other words, I love you so much that I must tell you the truth. If you can receive it and believe it, stand to your feet and give God a hand praise in the house of God.